I love having our kids in worship, don't you? They did a great job. You know? Get the extra loop around there. Man, they were tired by the end of it, weren't they? God, they made it, though. Little victories, you know? Little victories. I didn't see anybody picking their nose. Nobody. <laughs> so I want to start off today by telling you about one of my favorite concert experiences that I ever got to be a part of. And it's a band that you never hear about this time of year. You never hear about them during the summer, but about mid-October, they start thawing out of their, their icy slumber and they come out. You hear them nonstop for about a month through December, and then they go right back in their cave and they're not heard from again. They're called Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I, some of you are, are, are familiar. I've seen them in concert a couple of times. And it's, I always have fun at their concerts because, okay, the main reason that people know of them is they have one Christmas song. And their big thing is they take a lot of classical pieces and kind of modernize them a little bit. They're, they have, but they have this one, Chris, one Christmas song called Christmas Canon. And they've, they've taken Canon in D, you know, the classical music piece, and they've put these just heartwarming kids behind it, and they've made this, you know, that they've added lyrics to it, and it's just the most, ah, yes, sort of song. It's the sweetest thing. I mean, the kids just are so cute that, you know, they, you know, get a little dusty when you hear it. Because of that, people want to go see them in concert. Because, you know, you want to feel that live, you know? You want to feel that that extra oomph of being in the room when they're performing it. And I've seen them twice. And I can tell you that that song, that's not the norm for them. If you've ever seen them live, you know what I'm talking about. Trans-Siberian Orchestra, or TSO, as their friends call them, they're a rock band. You go see them. They, first off, they don't take those kids on tour with them. They don't. Three female vocalists sing that part, and they do it with squealing guitars, and there's lasers everywhere, and there's fire, and all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's pyro, and you know, there's you know, just all kinds of crazy, wild, heavy metal uh, stuff. And it's not what people expect. So when you get about three songs in of that, the, a lot of the people that came just for that one song, they realize they've made a horrible mistake. And about three songs in is when I start watching the exits. You know those little portals that they have at the BJCC? And you see a steady stream of about a quarter of the arena emptying out. <laughs> it's loud. Why is it so loud? Why is there fire up there? It's not what they expected. I can tell you, if you stick around, it's an amazing show. But for a lot of people that go in expecting this one thing, it being something else can totally, absolutely just throw you for a loop. And you could say that the city of, uh, of Jerusalem was a, was a little bit like that way too. And with that, let's go to our scripture reading for the day. Please stand for the the reading of God's holy word. Today we're living in John 12, verses 12 through 19. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The word of God for the people of God. Be to God. You may be seated. 
So we're in the middle of this series on spiritual disciplines. And today's theme is generosity. Now, on the surface, the story of Palm Sunday, you don't really get that theme right off the bat from it. On the surface, it doesn't really play in. But when you take the context, when you look at what was surrounding these events, it's the beginning of an absolutely insane level of generosity from the Father. Now, Jesus was coming off the resurrection of Lazarus, and the word was spreading, and the people knew now that this was something big. They were excited. Plus, the city was packed out for Passover, so there were already a lot of people. Historians estimate that there were probably between two and three million people lean in more towards three than two. So some came from Bethany with Jesus and some came out of the city. And so all the people in the city are coming out. They're super excited because Passover. And then you've got the celebrity factor of Jesus. And then you've got the people that came from Bethany saying, listen to what this guy did. That guy Lazarus from the dead. So Jesus is coming in the gates and people are going nuts. He borrows a donkey, which apparently was something you did back in the day, and then made his way into the city. Now, there was, in fact, some significance to this. And a donkey, by no means, is a royal mount. But it shows more of a connection to the people. And this is very different from the scene that David got when he came back into Jerusalem with the ark. Military leaders would have come in a chariot with an army, not on a donkey. And this move was very much non-military. Now, Zechariah 9.9 says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So, after the fact, after Christ's glorification, they think back and they realize, you know, kind of that 2020 in hindsight sort of thing. Oh. But in the moment, there was just a full sense of excitement. And this wasn't excitement like when my little boy has a friend coming to spend the night and he's counting the number of sleeps until such and such stays with me or the number of sleeps until the big party I wanna to go to. No, this is life-changing excitement. It's real excitement because people were thinking that everything was gonna change. The Messiah was here and it transformed them. In that moment, they're crying out, Hosanna. They're seeing their own inadequacies. They're seeing their own insecurities and they're crying out. They welcomed him as if he was a conquering king they're waving these palm branches. And that had become a symbol going back a century and a half. It was also on their currency as well. And they're taking outer garments off and laying them down for Christ to ride over. High fives, chest bumps, the whole deal. And for a crowd that had come out to meet Jesus, it was a wonderful, wonderful day. But I talked about taking context. And it didn't stay wonderful for long, did it? You ever been in the middle of something good and then remembered something bad was coming? It doesn't matter how great whatever it is is because you start dwelling on that bad thing that's happening. I had a job a few years ago that absolutely drained me. I would wake up early. The hours were horrible at this thing. It was a negative environment and you know, folks didn't treat each other very well. Um, and I mean, I was always tired. And it got to the point, it got in my brain so much that people around me could tell on Sunday when I remembered I had to go to that job on Monday. They said that you could actually see the weight, an invisible weight on my shoulders. 
my whole demeanor would change. I'd get quiet because I remembered. It didn't matter what great stuff was happening all around me. I was focused on that bad thing. And it took some of the joy out of it, right? It's called, there's a term for it now. It's called the Sunday scaries. Apparently, it's a thing now. It's on Sunday when you remember that something bad is, or maybe you're going to a job on Monday you don't really care for. Now, granted, you should be fortunate to have a job. You know, be thankful for that. But if you're living with that dread of going in, it takes some of the joy out of the days before because you know that the bad thing is coming. So take that feeling and imagine you're in the middle of a crowd in the city and they're proclaiming Hosanna. They're really excited that you're there, but you know what's coming. Because at this moment, Jesus knew what was coming. And when I try to think about myself in that aspect, when I try to think about what I would be feeling in that moment, the word I come from is isolation. Have you ever been in a room where everyone around you seems happy, but you're down? It's lonely, right? So Jesus is in the middle of almost 3 million people. And I, can, I can't imagine the solitude that he feels. Jesus knew it was coming. He knew that this ride into the city was a ride toward the cross. He knew where this road would eventually end. And the fervor of the crowd around him would be echoed days later in a crowd calling for the freeing of Barabbas. You see, this was the beginning of one final week for Jesus. Well, at least his final week as a human being on earth in this form. The week that would change everything and the week that showed his greatest generosity in the forgiveness of our sins by the death of his, his only son. And that's a heavy thing, but it leaves us asking why? Why do we celebrate Palm Sunday? Why did we have this joyous thing when we know that this other thing is coming? It doesn't make sense. Well, a lot of this doesn't make sense. The level of excitement. Yeah, there was excitement because of all that was going on, but the level they were at was irrational. That's because it was supernatural. These folks weren't just looking at a man riding a donkey. They were watching their Messiah enter the city. They recognized their own shortcomings and they cried out to him. And at the end of this passage, the frustration of the Pharisees is apparent in that they start to blame each other. They begin to plan and scheme because only the Sanhedrin's policy of judicial execution would work but they would need to be extremely careful in implementing it, and that they would do. The Pharisees were getting so frustrated, and it reminds me of something from, from my youth. Um, this past week, a dear friend of mine passed away. Uh, her name was Karen. Her husband, Scott, was my youth pastor when I was in high school. And for some reason, Scott allowed me and a couple of my friends a lot of freedom in coming up with skits and coming up with presentations and things in front of the church. I'm sure he regretted it many, many times. Um, and there was one set of skits we did as part of a youth week uh, presentation. It was a bunch of vignettes called Traps. And so Jason and Ben and I took these roles of Pharisees and we ended up showing the reaction of the Pharisees, you know, when they got back to the Pharisee clubhouse after Jesus had shown them up. I mean, they come running in. And of course, because we're high school kids and because we're making things, parts of things up before, as we go, and we've basically made them into Keystone cops. 
it's like a Three Stooges thing. They're falling over each other and that sort of thing. And they're coming in after, you know, you know give under Caesar what is Caesar's, give under God what is God's. Can you believe this? They're doing all these crazy things. And I still remember we actually made the word Pharisee into an acronym. We made it uh, to where it was the uh, people hating all righteous individuals seeking eternal edification spiritually. I have no idea why I remember that. No idea. To this day, I can still rattle it off. People hating all righteous individuals seeking eternal edification spiritually. Bradley, for your notes. You got all those? There you go. So I don't know why I remember that, but I do also remember the level of frustration from the Pharisees continuing to grow and grow. And I remember that being something that stuck with me. Because you have to think, why would people do what they do? Why would they go to all these lengths? And it was because they were seeing the whole world in their scope turning to follow Jesus. They started blaming each other. You see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Irony was used back then as a literary device as well, apparently. But it's interesting the way they said that, the world, the whole world. Traditionally, this word means all that exists or all that was created in the original text, but it's everything that they knew. You see, in this moment, it felt like a victory lap for those people that had gathered. This was it. Messiah is here. But things are not always what they seem. This was going to be a brutal, brutal week. And Jesus went along on a donkey through the gates, down the streets, knowing what he was going into. You ever known someone that put on a brave face in spite of what was happening to him? People in that crowd had no idea what Jesus was dealing with. And they didn't know what was to come. And I think about this, and I try to think about that isolation that Jesus felt. Now, hear me, I'm not saying this was unneeded, or this was senseless, because we know that it had to happen, right? Jesus was on his way through this joyful crowd as a major sign of God's generosity toward us. The sacrificial nature of it is immeasurable, and in the nature of sacrifice, it hurts. When we show generosity to others, we give more than money or a favor we give of ourselves. There's something to be said for the fact that most time when someone donates an organ, it's harder on them than it is on the person receiving the organ. You have medications you have to be on for years, the pain, the recovery. It's tough and it's a sacrifice, but you do it out of love. And God gave Jesus out of love for us, for the forgiveness of sins and for us to have everlasting life we should find generosity like that. We should give generosity like that. We shouldn't give because we want attention or because of some earthly reward like fame and glory. Don't give to an organization or to the church because you want your name on a building. That's not the point. We don't just give to have the list that the big guy upstairs keeps have a check on it beside our name. That's not what generosity is. Acts 4.32 uh, through 37 talks about how some people in the early church were selling things that they didn't need to give to those who were in need. And that caused a guy named Joseph to sell his field and give the money to the church. And it was a huge gift that the people were able to use. And they named him Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. But as is the nature of some people, other people saw that this guy got a lot of attention for what he did. I should do the same thing and maybe I'll get all that attention. Those people were not rewarded. They gave for the wrong motives. They were chasing fame. God knows what is sincere in our hearts and why we do things matters. John Wesley said in some of his letters, do all the good you can, but all, by all the means you can, in all the ways that you can, in all the places you can, in all the times that you can, 
to all the people you can as long as ever you can. We give freely out of love because God loves us and God shows us generosity. He gives us breath. He gives us life and he gave us salvation through his son. I can't wrap my head around that level of generosity. And it makes me reconsider what I would hold up as a sacrifice and reconsider that magnitude. And it really puts things in perspective. We can't match God's level of giving, can we? We'll never get to that level. But I tell you what we can do, we can model it. We can try to emulate or at least do our best to get to whatever level we can on this earthly plane, get to that example. Because in the same spirit that God has given us so much, we can give to each other. That afternoon spent helping a friend, that extra work to help a family member, the change spent on an organization you work with. You know, the typical model for tithing is 10%. And we need that because that, that allows the church to operate and to foster ministry. But it's just a, as much about why as it is what you give. And it's about emulating God's love and sacrifice. And I tell you, over the next week, we're gonna be talking a lot about that. We're gonna be talking about that generosity that God gave us. We're gonna be talking about what came from it. We're gonna be talking about the different ways that, that we were served by that. And it's definitely a dip throughout this week. On Good Friday, we'll gather here that night and we will experience some of that. We'll experience the darkest day. We'll all repeat back and forth, but Sunday's coming. And on Sunday, we'll get back together and we will celebrate the risen Christ. But in this moment, what can we do? In this moment, I challenge you to find ways to show that generosity. I challenge you to find ways to give selflessly. I challenge you to go out into the world. And money is good, but at the same time, give your time, give your attention. Give your, your love to people that need it. And do it selflessly. Don't do it for reward. Don't do it for fame. Don't do it for any sort of payback. Do it because we're emulating the generosity that God gave us. Mike is gonna come up in a few minutes. And I'm the worst with Micah because Whenever I preach, I'm, I'm the one that always asks for a song we don't normally do. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm awful about that. And this week, no exception. Um, it's one of my favorite songs. And um, it fit so well into today's message because when we're given that level of generosity, there's only one response and it's eternal gratitude. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, how can we possibly thank you enough for the sacrifice that you've given us? God, how can we, how can we come to you and repay? God, help us to find the words. Help us to find the deeds, God. Help us to live into your example and the example of Christ to follow you, knowing that it's gonna be uncomfortable. God, give us the courage to do that and help us to emulate your generosity, God. Allow us to become closer to you throughout this week, God, and help us to remember that as dark as it gets throughout this week, Sunday is coming. In your son's name, amen.